Galimera, Galispera, Galinikta. No matter where in this wild, wacky, and sometimes wonderful world you might be, thank you for making the Highbury Squad part of your day. We're going to talk a little bit about the beautiful game from all corners of the earth with some very special guests and an absolute legend in the house. Let's rock and roll. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. <clears throat> oh, yes. We love a little stateside stuff, and I'm um, really delighted to be to be joined by some epic guests this evening. One of your favorites, my wingman for tonight before Super Kev returns, uh, ex former Luton Town, former Luton Town manager, Mr. Paul Buckle, back in the house. Welcome, Paul. Bosh. Cheers, cheers, Soph. Hi, Mike. Hi, Jermaine. Sporting a tan, looking refreshed up there. You are, Paul. I like it. I like it. Um, also joining is one of my favorite humans, an epic human, um, USL2 champion with Ventura County Fusion, now assistant coach at Central Valley Fuego FC. Even the dogs are getting excited to welcome, I know squaddies, you're not going to like this part, a Tottenham fan in the house, Mr. Mikey Leas. Welcome. Uh, thank Bosh, you very much. <laughs> Great and to be of here. Course, <laughs> and of course, bottom left-hand corner on your screens, um, this is a familiar face for all of you, uh, US men's national team legend, current manager of Central Valley Fuego FC, the absolute brilliant Mr. Jermaine Jones. Welcome. Bosh. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're delighted for you to be here. Here's how we're going to rock and roll this year. And of course, squaddies, welcome at ease. Uh, we salute all of our listeners. Thanks to those of you who are joining us live. We've got our chief like officer in the house, Tammy Steels. Don't forget to hit those like buttons. We've got Trevor in the house. We've got PW. Carol is here. Um, we've got Tom in the house, uh, Mark's here, the whole Jam fam is here, um, and uh, thank you so much. We like to do our stateside squad shows. The beautiful game is growing here. I'm going to start off um, with with Jermaine, because Jermaine, Paul and I have talked about this a lot, Super Kev refuses to go into management. He says that he's happy looking back on his playing career, but management isn't for him. The transition from playing and going to coach, how have you found that? You know, um, I was similar. I, I when I when I played, I said always I, I never will go into coaching. And I stayed, I wanted to stay away so far. But um, you know how sometimes life is, it comes around, right? So I when I retired, I was like for two I would say almost two and a half years. I was I loved it driving my kids to school and being a, a soccer dad sitting outside and watching my kids play and and um but then something you know something was missing and um i tried some other businesses and tried to do some stuff but somehow i fell back into coaching when when i started doing all my lessons and um and then i went overseas back to europe um stayed in belfast to do my license and um and met a lot of guys or played with or played against and um in in the moment you you have this locker room coming back that locker room feeling and the, the soccer conversations and all this stuff um I fell back in 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 love with the with the game, but um, but this time I felt more in love with the game. About like um, I would not say that, and I said this always to Mike. It's not about the training sessions on the field. It's more about the player management, understanding the player, and how can you make the player better even without touching the field, you know. So, and that's mm. that's the stuff what makes me um, really interested in in coaching. Mike, did you were you guys? Did Jermaine do the ba his badges with you when you were at Ventura County? Is that how you guys met? Is was was yeah. that your in? Yeah, we actually met on the B license with uh, USSF um, uh, over in Kansas, and just built a relationship from there, really. And you uh, joined from USL to you won the championship with Ventura County, which is amazing, an incredible achievement. What enticed you to leave a role where you were head coach to go as an assistant coach? Of course, of you know Jermaine's absolute legend. But what 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 motivated you to make that switch? Well, first of all, when I met Jermaine, um, I appreciated him as a human. 
holistically. Uh, he's uh, the way he's as a man, the way he thinks um, is is top draw. And to me, to be honest, I got the call from Jermaine once he got the head coaching position at Fuego, and it was a no-brainer for me. Uh, you know, to learn from one of the great great players in in US who's done it all, you know, he's played Champions League, World Cup for his country. Um, he, he's seen it all. So to learn from someone like Jermaine and to be a student of his, it just goes on to my development uh, in my path as a coach. And Paul, you've managed at Sacramento Republic as well and also on the other side in, uh, you know, back home in, in England, Luton Town, uh, among other clubs. We're going to get into like the nuances and maybe stigmas, but it's such, it's so hard. And I, I go to USL games here at Orange County Soccer Club. I love them. I love how close I am to the game as a fan rather than sitting in a big, massive stadium. You unearth some gems of players. Um, how did you find that transition from going from managing a club like Luton to coming here and trying to break into the, into the, um, into the sports world here in, in the US? Well, originally, Rebecca and I moved to the East Coast. Um, I found out very quickly that, you know, sort of 10 years ago, nobody really knew who Luton were then, or Bristol mm -hmm. Rovers or Torquay. Um, so, yeah, I started again. I mean, I've shared this story before, and I share it with members at the LMA that have aspirations to come to the States. It wasn't easy, but it was good for me. Uh, might use the word learn, uh, to learn again, learn the culture, learn the system. Uh, proud I did that in a got a job in an academy um, called Met Metropolitan Oval. I um, was very proud of the work I'd done there with some great coaches uh, and then got my break with, with the Republic. And I was fortunate, Sophie, that when I went in the Republic, it was all set. I'd followed a really great coach there called Preki. The, the, the listeners will know. Um, but the infrastructure was there. And on reflection of all the jobs that I've done, been all been very different uh, with different challenges. But if, if you can come into one with a great infrastructure where you have good people, I mean, are great people. I didn't have to change anything. Uh, I'd looked at previous games, saw where I thought I could add some value. Um, but I can tell you it's a, it's, it is a, it is a great thing if you can go into something that's, that's, you know, already up and running, have great support. Um, I think the guys might know Jesse signs. Um, I think he does some stuff with, Fuego. Uh, Jesse was an expert in his department. I had a great goalkeeping coach. Um, so, yeah, I had great support in all the areas. And I had to just build relationships, as Jermaine said, with the players, find out, you know, uh, their strengths and weaknesses and uh, build from there. But it, it, it was a, a great transition for me. Uh, Jermaine, I was saying to Mike, He's lost so much weight. I can't, I mean, he looks so lean and fit. And, um, you know, we talk a lot on our show about, you know, we, we fans are very quick. We have opinions. We're very quick to criticize players. That's what we do on these shows. We're, we're a kind community here though. Um, but you know, you've always been trim, always in shape. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a photo of you where you've put on an extra pound. And your philosophy is, I always think when I look at coaches and they're preaching to players every single day to kind of live a certain philosophy, is that the magic behind kind of, you know, you, Mike, getting him to get lean and fit as well and what you expect not only from your players but your staff? Yeah, he, you know, I, I I'm, I'm always say this, I'm the, I'm the hardest critic, you know, critic person uh, with myself, right? So in, um, in for me, was it something when I looked at it and I said, you know, majority of the players are younger guys, you know, they're, they're maybe in this, in the league now for two, two years, or maybe just started off in, um, a lot of them see me even, or saw me still playing. Right. So in, and if I walk into the locker room and I will be overweighted in, and cannot kick the ball anymore and everything, people will look at it and they go, his he, he himself has no discipline you know so how can he preach discipline to us so and that's something where i i i really hide you know put high on my on my list on my coaches and everybody to say look if we preach that they're being you know disciplined and have like you know what they're eating 
how much sleep they're getting, what they're doing, how to take care of their bodies and all that stuff, then that's something what we have to preach to and what we have to live mm-hmm. to, you know? And, um, and that's something, especially as a young coach, um, I still jump into the sessions, you know, and, um, and, and do sometimes and, and show them, you know, I'm not just telling you to play this ball, that ball is possible. And, um, and, and, and show him then that ball, you know? So, and that's, I think is what I said before, that's the way of, I believe I can connect with the players because they're looking at it and say, look, he was there, he did it on the highest stage and he's not just saying it, he lived it and he still lives it now, you know? So, and, and that's, um, yeah, Mike, you know, um, he, Mike knows it, my, you know, Eddie, the, the other assistant coach and the goalkeeper coach, everybody knows, you know, I'm a vegan since eight years. So, mm. um, you know, I take care of my body. I take care of, um, you know, uh, we go biking, me and Mike, we go biking, we go, we do running, we do all this stuff, you know, and yeah, Mike is, He's in, in his best shape. Certainly. <laughs> so you can run rings. You can running rings around the young ones now, Mike. Is that what's happening? <laughs> no, that's absolutely not what's happening. But um, I try. I try. I think I, I jumped in a session, felt my hammy, and I, did, I haven't jumped in since. But I, I certainly do feel a lot better. I tried a crossbar challenge last year, and I I I, I did my hammy in. Yeah, I've uh, got a long way long way to go to get my my fitness back. Um, let's tap into a little bit, uh, before we talk about the U S uh, men's national team, cause I'd love to get all of your takes on that. Um, I do want to talk about the differences of USL MLS. And in particular, I've been a massive fan of the U S open cup since I moved to America. I think that's because it's the closest thing here, um, to the FA cup and also one of the oldest competitions i think the stanley cup might be the um the oldest um and then and then the us open cup in in sports paul you grew up mike you you grew up i know uh, jermaine grew up in you know in germany um with the polka and a whole bunch of other tournaments that are really cool and connect fans uh paul us open cup you played uh you were manager at sacramento republic uh, i think a little bit like the FA Cup, it's trying to be diminished, the decision to kind of pull teams this season. Uh, sacrilegious, in my opinion. Uh, and I I think a lot of fans are up in arms about it. I know Seton O'Connor from the Dan Patrick Show, um, we've talked about that, and he's made it very vocal about his support for US Open Cup. What's your take on what's happening with that particular tournament? Well, from... <clears throat> from my experiences, the Open Cup was was great. I mean, um, of course, comparing is, is difficult, comparing it with the FA Cup. It does have similarities. Um, it's something that needs building. It needs to be recognised in the football world in America. Uh, and these guys just went down and played uh, Folsom, I believe, mm-hmm. which is where I where I live. Um, the excitement around the place that, that these guys were coming down to play and there was an opportunity to play against, uh, you know, professional uh, position, uh, a chance to maybe upset, okay, which we've seen a million times in the FA Cup. I think that's just one example of why it's it's so great and a challenge for Jermaine and Mike's players to go down there and you know find the skill sets needed away from home in a in a different environment to go and go through. And then of course you have the opportunity to meet bigger clubs as as you go along. But I had uh, a good a great experience where we we went far, but that. That in the in the competition we beat some MLS teams, but uh, prior to that we did get beat by a lower team where maybe I got it wrong. Where you know I did play some of the guys that hadn't been playing, um, and it didn't work out. But I think it's a great thing overall. I think that the US Open Cup is a is a is a is a great uh, competition, and I'd be very interested to hear what what the guys think. Jermaine, you get you get good crowds at home. Um, you know, you've played on the biggest stage of all. Uh, you've played in the World Cup Champions League. Um, you've played, you know, against some of the world's best. Um, there's a magic about these cups that connects communities. You know, for me, I know MLS has grown and it's become a beast. But to me, at the, at the heart of MLS, it's still a regional sport. It's all about community. If those fans, um, you know, who are local don't show up, the stadiums are empty. They've helped grow the game. What? How do you feel about, as now as manager, how do you feel about the US Open Cup? What does it mean to your team, your squad and you in particular? No, for us as a club, we were sitting down, you know, when the first conversations came up and um, people said that maybe they were not playing it in, you know, who's playing and who's not playing. Um, we, we said clearly that, 
in the beginning we doubt a little bit and then we said okay we want to play because it's at the end it comes down it's 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 a cup for people right and it, it brings people together in you know like paul said like as a as a bigger club you go in to the smaller clubs and it's an exciting day for them you know they can maybe kick you out you know most of the time it's just, it's something special because i've played it so many times in germany with the dfb book Cup, you know where you go into this this is big event for small countries or small clubs in in small uh, areas in in you know in in Germany, where like they're looking to play against Bayern Munich or the Schalke and Ophir, and and I think it's the same now here, and it helps grow in the game because at the end, the people who come in, that's the people who even because, we, that's the people who then now who support Sacramento, who play champions championship, you know, or or like close teams who 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 support then the Galaxy or whoever, you know. So, but I, as a coach, then I see it from the opposite view too, where I'm like look at it and go, if you. You know, let's say LAFC, if they're playing CONCACAF, Champions League and all this stuff in, and they're limited on budgets and, um, and they cannot go completely in in their half uh, 60 or 50 games to play and you don't have the roster to play that, then somewhere it hurts you because that's an extra game or extra two, three games. So in and that's something too, as a coach, you look and you say, okay, how much budget I get that I can actually pay as or Get as much players in if i have a, in germany i said with Schalke, you, you have a 35 man roster of course you you build for three competitions you know and then even players play national team and everything but if you don't have that that can hurt you on the on the run then in your own in your own league you know where you have majority you're saying oh we want to let's say win the, the the championship now let's say with fuego here in league one but if we play in, on the road on Wednesday innings and then we get our top guys get injured, that hurts us then in the long run with a with a with a with a league game, right? So and I think that's mm-hmm. that's the majority why a lot of teams, especially from MLS, said, okay, we we have to pull out then. Mike, you know, we talk a lot on our show about the impact more games have on players, and that hap- that's happening at every level now. Jermaine's talk, you know, talking about you know, making decisions based on how does that going to affect the team long term? You know, is that going to diminish our ability to win what's important, which is, you know, the title? We see it. And squaddies, for those of you who showed up a little bit late or those listening on replay, don't hold it against Mike. He's a Spurs fan. He's a really good guy, though. He's he's one of our good guy Spurs fans um, that show up when we talk North London derby, like uh, Ricky Saxon, Chris Cowlin and Anthony Costa. Um, Mike, you saw your club win the FA Cup. You haven't seen them win something in a long time. I had to get that one in. Um, oh, a couple. But, <laughs> but but what does what does it mean to you, having come from England and you know uh, been through the ranks and now here and and what what does it mean to you and and how do you feel about the bigger clubs kind of pulling out and and pushing away from it? Well, I think we've seen even in England. I mean, I grew up. The FA Cup was a, a, a marvelous thing. You know, something that you, you kind of, if you couldn't go to a game, if your team wasn't in it, um, then you would watch it on TV. And there was a big thing about it from morning to the game and then afterwards. I think even in England, the FA Cup's diminished a little bit as well um, in favour of maybe so-called bigger competitions in Europe, for example. Um, but I think it's so important to have some of this and really echoing from what the guys are saying as well. It, it, it should be romanticised a little bit as well. Uh, it does offer underdogs a chance to uh, pit their wits with the with the bigger teams. And what we can't forget as well, he also gives opportunities for good players playing at the lower leagues to actually show what they have. Uh, and it gives them a platform to actually perform and hopefully climb up the ladder for them uh, career-wise as well. So I think it's such an important thing I think, you know, the bigger clubs coming out of it this year is is a shame. It's a real shame. Mm. Um, and, you know, maybe that's something uh, that can be looked upon. You know, the reasons why, you know, th- th- there's reasons for everything, right? But uh, the reasons why I think it, it's far outweighed by, you know, what the Open Cup has meant in, in the U.S., considering the U.S. is a, is a fairly young market still. You know, I've been here for about 25 years and seen the U.S. change dramatically soccer-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but it's it is a shame i mean i'm i'm pretty sad about that yeah i remember when i first arrived here it was you could find a game on fox soccer channel and uh you know if you missed it you were shit out of luck you know that that was that was it uh, and now to, i i do think though the european coverage of the game has helped grow it here Paul, do you do you agree with that? Um, before we get onto a little U.S. men's national team stuff in Europe football, let's talk about that because I think the 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 Premier League in particular, Bundesliga coverage. Um, I think ESPN do a great job with Bundesliga. I think it's as exciting as the Premier League. Uh, we're seeing one of the most the craziest races. Um, what Leverkusen are doing there. We'll get Jermaine's take on that in a sec, but. As well as what MLS have done, um, USL to me, it's like it it's growing and growing. I've seen crowds just get bigger and bigger at Orange County Soccer Club. They did a great thing where they offered um, fans to become uh, part owners. You know, a hundred bucks you can you can be an owner. Uh, a little bit of what we've seen in Europe too. What's your take on the growth of the the game here? The World Cups are the reason. Um, is it MLS? Is it the European game? What's your take? You've been here long enough to see the trajectory and the evolution as well. Mm. Yeah, obviously, <clears throat> the Premier League um, was obviously the, the reason Sophie come, as you know, with Rebecca. Uh, that alone, the growth of the Premier League out here has been massive. I mean, you take uh, FanFest, for example, in Nashville. I think they've sold 20,000 there for that that um fan fest where people come you know they put a great event on uh, premier league fund it you've seen the premier league come out for the summer series with the teams i know that was a brilliant experience for the managers of those clubs that come out you know i, was, I spoke about this before in england you know you can hardly do anything at times you know publicly but there was a, there was a freedom about it there's a different culture in the in the united states compared with europe and I think it's refreshing in, in many ways. Um, I think ESPN have done a great job with uh, USL. I thoroughly look, yeah, uh, you know, good look point. forward to the games. Um, mm. It's it's excellent. If you're in a club in England and say, say you're at Southampton, like I was, and you're doing the exits, for example, you can show some really great footage of what USL looks like, you know, and, and I think that, Looking at it from it, it with that lens, um, some of the, the players in, in England that are coming out of the Premier League, the young players, some of them are not good enough so to make it in the USL Championship. I, but I can't speak for USL 1, but, you know, it's very good. Um, there's some fantastic players in America. Um, the Fusion, um, as Mike would know, have, have had countless players come out of there good enough. And I think... Um, to, to Mike's point as well, the Open Cup, going back to that, you can then get to scout these players in such a huge country. You can get to see them. But, yeah, the growth of the game has been astonishing and I don't see it easing up. I mean, I see how busy uh, Rebecca is in, in her industry with the Premier League. Um, and, of course, you've got over 50% uh, ownership now in the Premier League and the EFL in England uh, owned by Americans. So, yeah, I, th I don't see the growth of the game stopping at all. Mm. Jermaine, a lot of the times, you know, um, we there's so much football now and there's been talk about how MLS doesn't help the U.S. men's national team. I'm not even going to ask you that question. You've been asked it ad nauseum. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to know from you as a player, uh, because you've played at the, the highest level, uh, like I said, and, you know, absolutely infamous moment, the goal against Portugal, playing against Cristiano Ronaldo's Portugal. Uh, it was just a magical, magical moment in the World Cup. And a lot of people now consider the Champions League to be above the World Cup. I want to get it from the fan perspective from the guys too and also from you who played in both. Is For you, is the pinnacle you played in the Champions League? You were in the Schalke team that beat Arsenal. I think it was 2-0 at the Emirates. Thank you for that. Um, what, what, what one for you is like the pinnacle of football? No, I think it's just, just an easy one. Like if you go out in the streets and you ask kids, what is your big dream as a, as a kid? Right? They all say, I want to be a professional. And then one day, if I have the chance, I want to play a World Cup or something. That's, that's the biggest. That's the biggest party in the world. Um, Champions League, of course, is something special. 
but still on the club level in president to go out to represent your country it's 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 always something different and you you just know in you know how everything's prepared how you travel over there then you go to the stadiums the whole world is watching even guys who who be playing professional and not making the roster for their countries even them watching so everybody is watching that tournament so i think the nothing can compete with the world cup you know i understand the champions league is something where you have you know the best players in every club's playing you know season for season against each other but it's like even too when you look at the, the beginning stages some of the games are not interested right and then it comes to mm. a stage where now it gets interested because you see the best coaches against each other you see the best players against each other and i think it's the same with the world cup i think it's just the world cup is you have to wait every couple of years to get it again and it's not every year i think if the world cup would come every year then i think it would be the same where people would say like it's it's nothing special anymore so and i think so the world cup is for me for me was i missed two so and when i was able then to go for the one um i i it was a, a childhood dream came true and then to score in a world cup i mean you know, sometimes people joke, it's better than chocolate, it's better than sex, it's better than all these different things, Jermaine. But not only did you score a goal, but the significance of the goal. I can't imagine, other than maybe having kids, you know, um, it's the most insane feeling you've ever had in your whole life. Yeah, no, it, it was. You know, for me, what I said, I, I missed, you know, I missed the 2010 World Cup with a, with a hairline crack in my shin. Um, in one one month late to to make it um and then when that came you know the 2014 a lot of people don't know but i i played in the beginning i, I just moved to Besiktas istanbul uh six months before the world cup started and um and i started getting pain in my hernia and um and, and i went to the doctors and they told me that um i had a double hernia and i needed surgery but so now we said there's there's two options you do the surgery straight away we don't know if you get fit to the to the, to the game is starting or you go with the pain and you get through the workup. So, and I said, okay, let me go through the workup and play with it. Um, but again, the anxiety, my, my kids were there, my, you know, the, the people around the, the atmosphere, a kids, a childhood dream comes through. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't feel the pain. It was just excited. And then, mm -hmm. you know, people talk about Cristiano and I can, you know, I saw him playing against him a couple of times with Champions League and everything, but, um, you know, coming out of a group uh, where everybody said the group of death with Ghana, Germany, and in Portugal um, was then something you know where scoring is always you know you in the in the books of history. Then to score in a World Cup, that's not just a scoring for your country; it's scoring at the World Cup, and that's yeah. Um, I had to I had to cut my dreads so that I was able to walk through the streets a little bit undercover because <laughs> people people were starting more focusing on the game, but um. But it's beautiful, you know, for me, it's like when I look at back in 2010, when I came and decided to play for this country, um, soccer was still not where it is now, you know, and and I think uh, we all of you guys already touched it on. See now, you know, the growth of the game, it's it's, it's beautiful. In working now with the U19s, I see the talent we have in, in this in, in this country. It's, it's amazing. But then seeing the growth outside, how people, and I think the biggest push what was the change is, that social media opened up a complete different platform, you know, because the American mm -hmm. people, they had just their eyes on in the American market. And there was the market was just like the woman's side were achieving more than the men's side. So, and people were going away and they liked the basketball and they liked the American football. But uh, the moment that that opened up with social media and everything were well, able to look, oh, there's a market, the big market overseas too, and they're famous too, and there's something going on. In, in then Europe guys were seeing, oh, wait a minute, let me get a, a, my branding in the US, you know, and you see the, the Paul Park bars and all the people coming over, the superstars. Now it created that people said, okay, that's why you have the Cronkies, you have the Kraft families, the Hunts, like everybody even now overseas, you know, own in Liverpool, Chelsea, like uh, Arsenal, you know, so because they see it, it's a market, it's untouched. And I believe too, if we as a country build that out smart way with the League One, championship in MLS and get combined and, and work with each other that we can get a powerhouse because the talent is there because we have mm. such a such a big market we can we can grab players from and we just have to you know be on the same page uh Paul just to touch on that real quick before I get back to the Champions League question with Mike I Jermaine brings up a really interesting point because for so long since I've lived here 
there's always been this discussion of promotion relegation will never work in the US because of the sports model. It gets to a time in the NFL, the NBA, um, MLS, uh, where there's no jeopardy. Um, you know, uh, I like even the playoffs for the relegation spot in in some leagues in Europe. What do you think about what Jermaine just said in terms of com- having like MLS Division One, Two? Do you think there'll come a day where relegation promotion will be embraced, or do you think there's still a way to do it and have jeopardy? I'm not quite sure if there is without the promotion and relegation part. <clears throat> yeah, getting uh, I suppose getting the American. Uh, supporter to understand relegation and promotion would be the first thing. Obviously, with what's happened with Wrexham and the documentary, they can understand what it's like for a team to be sitting in the conference or National League for 15 years, okay, and then and then see it accelerate like it has now once it's got out. But how difficult it is to get out and what comes with it. Um, I think that's been a good marketing tool to show the excitement um, for these, you know, these two owners, um, as they said, really and truthfully, they've never felt anything like that, you know, especially the way it went, you know, in the playoffs and the semis. And, I, and I've been a part of that a lot in my career. And there's nothing, there's nothing better than going through the playoffs, right? We, we've got that from America. So I think in terms of uh, relegation and promotion, I can see it in USL now. I could see USL uh, buying into that because they do have the, the tier system, okay? They've got a pyramid, a good pyramid um, now, and I'm a, a great advocate of USL. Um, getting by him from MLS might be might be a little bit different. Um, I think that'll be a longer term mm. project, but um, I can see certainly before Jake Edwards left, I think there was talk of it. I'm not quite sure whether they're, they're still gonna push forward with the idea of it. You do have to take into account the size of the country as well. Um, in terms of the travelling and what that might involve. But it would be very interesting to give it a go, uh, certainly in, in, in USL maybe, you know, Championship League One. Because I've seen that the levels, the levels are very good and, and not too far apart. Mike, do you think that it's not possible because now to buy into a team in MLS, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. What owner is going to invest that kind of money or has invested that kind of money and then, you know, look at the po- the potential of being relegated. But if it's still a regional sport and they get that support, but the commercial value does diminish, do you think that's why they're reticent to to kind of maybe make this happen at some point? I think there's a there's quite a few reasons, but I think, Sophie, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, there is a lot of money that's involved, especially at the MLS level. And to say to a, to an owner, you know, invest all the money and then get a chance of, you know, within a season you drop out um, of, a, of a major league, that's a big, that's a big risk. Um, and our owners, you know, willing to plow the amount of money asked for franchises now in MLS and have the risk of, of going down. Um, I think you, you've always got to look at things. I mean, I'm a big advocate for promotion relegation. I think that adds to the excitement um, of, of competition and the spectacle. But, you know, whether it will work on a, on a US model, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's got a ways to go um, before anything like that can be implemented. Yeah, interesting. I I think yeah, I I think if it's hap- if it's something that's going to happen, it's got it's going to be years and years down the line. And I tend to ag- agree with Paul. USL s- certainly has the setup, and I think you know now with ESPN broadcast money, more money coming into it, but still, Jermaine, to kind of go from, you know, you played for Schalke, Eintracht Frankfurt, you've been part of the US men's team, um, you were part of big teams like New England Revolution, LA Galaxy. The money in USL, uh, is it something that is improving? You know, we've definitely seen the club I go to watch, Orange County Soccer Club, had a record um, sale to a team in France uh, last season. What's your take on the investment? Because marketing dollars change everything. Marketing dollars really made the Premier League what it is today. How How's that going? I think year for year you can see that um, 
you know, USL is, is getting bigger in, you know, in, um, I think it's like now it's like it, it become the tricky part is like with the traveling. I think that's the tricky part. Even if I look in with us now, right, when we are playing over in, on the east side, we, we, we almost take one day to travel in, in, in that can be a lot, you know, but I think it's like, would be interesting to see if, um, you know, I, I think there's possibilities, but it's like maybe having two leagues where you say championship, it's called two championships in, you know, and then you have them um, on the, on one on the east side and one on the west side with teams. And, and then the finals, they play each other to have the final, you know, so you have a champion in the east and the champion things and you have a complete, like somehow, you know, um, I don't know, you know, I hear too that the problem is with relegation and promotion. It's just like, I think it's from, from day one, because I talked with somebody, um, I think a week ago, and he asked me about the same. And I said, if I look back in Germany, we had um, Red Bull, Leipzig or Hoffenheim came in, mm -hmm. but they had to start in the fifth league, you know, and both owners said, okay, I have no problem to invest in the five fifth league because I, I'm able to spend the money I want. And they will run through all the leagues then because they have just the money and they put the money behind it, but they still have to start on the bottom. So now you can say, and the top, if you're on the top and you don't you know, play good, you can go down again. But if you buy yourself in, you know, if that takes at the end, if you buy something that gives you the, the, the way to say, I'm selling it whenever I want to sell because I bought it. You give me a price, I pay the price. And now you, you know, you cannot take it away or put me down because we playing that good. And now I have to invest again because that's just a business. And, and I think, um, you know, but I, I, I look at always the, the way and I say the credit to MLS, because I believe MLS was a big, a big part of this in this country to help the, the, the game growing, you know, and we're talking about numbers. They're, 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 they're fa fantastic for MLS and they're crazy if, if you if you hear them, but it's something what, you know, Don Garber and the people and the owners, they're built out. And I think USL is now coming in, in um, step by step building something out too. And I think for the fan, for the people around the, the game, I think we all would like to see um, promotion in relegation at one point because I think it's just the fire. It, it, it gives you something in the game. So, and, um, but yes, mm -hmm. it, it would take time because people have to sit on the table and, and, and go to risk to lose a lot of money if it comes to the point. Um, we switch gears a little bit here and start talking a little bit about what's happening this summer. It's, we got the Olympics, which I'm sure, Paul, you'll be off to. <laughs> Um, Rebecca's going to be hosting the Olympics again on uh, on NBC with the great team over there. Um, Mike, we've got the Euros. Um, unfortunately, Greece, our Greece lost on penalties uh, last night to Georgia. Congratulations, Georgia. Yeah, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and uh, there's always England to root for, and we pretty much know how that's going to go. Jermaine, Germany um, are looking much better than they were. And Jermaine, the U.S. and Copa America as well this year. I mean, there's more football than ever. I'm not saying there's too much football. Uh, but, Paul, let me start with you. We're going to have Copa America here in the summer. I cannot wait. I covered it in 2016. And, Jermaine, were you playing in the 2016 tournament for, at Copa America? Were the US you were, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. Um We've got Copa America. Some of the biggest and best are coming here again. The World Cup in 2026. Like Jermaine said, the women's team kind of, you know, I think have totally transformed the game for women. Um, they're now, uh, you know, they found some tough love in Australia. Emma Hayes is going to come here and whip them into shape, I think. A lot of football. I mean, America is the place. And I remember in 94 when people were poo-pooing the idea of the World Cup being here. We just had John Hawks on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about that and how he remembers being part of the U.S. team and people poo-pooing it, and they were worried if anyone was going to show up. I don't think that's the issue now. What is your take on this current team in the U.S., um, beating Mexico, dos a cero again, very pleasurable. Uh, what is your take on the U.S.'s journey, and how do you see them coping against some of the biggest in Copa America this summer? Well, I think as Jermaine said there, he's working with the 19s and the talent is here, right? So, and and to, to your point there about the, the football and how we're viewed now, and I say we've lived in the country for nearly 11 years, it's, it's night and day. 
Mike's been here a lot longer than I, but it is it is night and day now how we are viewed in America by certainly England. I can speak about. I mean, just through the amount of uh, calls I get uh, working with the LMA now and the interest from some you know top top coaches that that want to come to America. They don't know an awful lot about it, but that's my job. But yeah, they. They take, they're taking it very seriously. And certainly the men's national team, the, the women's team, the growth of NWSL, which I've been part of, um, is fantastic. So I, I, I would say that the, the growth of the game in, in our country now is probably the fastest in any country uh, of growth. Um, and the men's uh, national team, I mean, no one, no one quite better than Jermaine to, uh, to, to give his thoughts on that. I certainly won't be diluting that. Um, We've got enough focusing on England and sometimes my frustrations mm-hmm. with, <laughs> you know, how we play it and, and what Gareth's picking. But no, uh, that's a that's a difficult job. We know management's difficult. But yeah, uh, I think that the, the men's national team has a great opportunity just through um, in terms of the size of the country, right? And the scouting and, and with Matt Crocker coming in now as well, I think in very good hands with somebody like Matt. Mike, one of the things that really pisses me off is the stigma that is attached to a U.S. player or a coach if they go to Europe. And personally, you know, I've lived here for 23 years now, go back to Europe. Some of the atmospheres I see, at whether it's LAFC, whether, you know, you look at the expansion teams like Austin, like Nashville, you go to a U.S. women's national team game, you go to... Uh, you see the game um, and the and the rivalry, one of the best rivalries in all of sports, in my opinion, US v. Mexico. It really annoys me that people can't get past. Saw it with my club and Matt Turner. Okay, Matt Turner may not be a quality of, of a goalkeeper to start for Arsenal. He's still a good goalkeeper. He's the national goalkeeper for the US. We even saw it go back, further back. Brian McBride, Clint Dempsey, um, even when Landon Donovan went on loan to Everton. It annoys me seeing it from our side. Is that something that really annoys you? And do you think like um, Jesse March, you know, getting called, you know, the whole Ted Lasso stuff? I really, I really think that show is great, but I don't think it's helped anyone going to to Europe who's American who wants to be part of the sport. Is that something that annoys you? It, it is, and, and you know, you mentioned Ted Lasso. I mean, I, I love that series; it's brilliant. But let's be honest, it doesn't really help us uh, when we're trying to be a professional outfit here in the US. Um, Look, I think I've seen development over the last 25, 26 years in in America. And I think the biggest development curve is when I first came out here, uh, volunteers were coaching teams and players, especially the young players coming through. And they didn't have any experience. You know, they kind of watched Um, a video and and back in the day it was an actual video that you put in a video recorder um, (laughs) you know to watch things play you know you got things from manuals and I think the biggest difference now is people coaching the game have played it number one Uh, they they understand the game Um, and they're coaching youth players with a lot more knowledge now And, and what you find is the younger players coming through. I mean, there's some good players. I know um, Jermaine spoke about the U19 national team when he was there and he saw the talent. And that's because I think of this uh, process of there's more soccer-minded people in the game now, whereas 26 years ago, he was just kind of a fab. You mm. know, it, it was um, the women's national team certainly puts her on the map in America for sure. Um, And then it's just kind of evolved and taken off from there. But I'm certainly seeing a lot more, you know, better quality of youth players coming through. I mean, one of the things I've done at at the Fusion was we we had a US SL Academy team and we had an MLS Next program as well. And and the level of play will be comparable comparable to youth in in England, uh, as it were. Whereas years ago, there was just a huge void. There was a huge difference in the two. So I think the Mm. gap is definitely closing. Yeah, Jermaine, you've been on both sides. You've been on it, you know, as a young player uh, coming through the ranks in Bundesliga. 
um, then playing at national uh, national level. Um, what's your take on this current team? Because one of the things that you know annoys me is that I think some people tend to forget some of these players are playing for some really big teams. And we're also seeing, like one of the listeners just mentioned, Hadji Wright, the impact he had, what a moment for Coventry against Wolves in the FA Cup. Pulisic, who is re reborn again at Milan. Um, you know, you've got Weston McKenney, uh, who's having, I think he has one of the, he's at the top for assists in Europe at Juventus. What do you think this team is capable of, Jermaine? I mean, a strong Copa America, people keep saying if they don't get out of the group, it's a failure. Everything builds to 2026. A lot of people don't like the coach. They don't like what happened off the field. But on the field, this team, what do you think they're capable of? I think the group is in a, uh, it's a, it's a, a talented group. It's a strong group. In, um, but I think I, I like to see more than playing now against um, bigger countries. You know, so that you get really, you can see what the difference is. You know, um, if you play four times against Mexico, and I think we run over Mexico now, that's the reality. So Mexico is not that rival anymore. Maybe on paper, yeah, but if you look at the players, no, they don't. So, and, and it's clearly you can see in the games when we face them. So, but um, but then like even too, um, I want to see us more playing against England, Germany, the France, bring the big. The, the big countries, you know, because then that shows you. Because like if you go you now Copa America, you will get maybe challenged with some big, big countries, you know. And and I think that's the only way how you you learn, you know. As a coach, I always say, you know, you're allowed to make mistakes. As a professional level, you have to learn, you know, how quick you learn from the mistakes, you know. And I think that is something now. We have a young group, and they will make mistakes. We saw that at the at the World Cup in Qatar, you know, and and it was a learning stage for a lot of them. Was the first World Cup. You know, now comes a Copa America in, and then comes a comes a World Cup at home. So, but before that, I strongly believe you have to put them in challenges where they get challenged. You know, um, playing against Mexico, I don't think it's any more a challenge. Even all the respect to Mexico, all the respect to um, to uh, Jamaica and all the countries around us, but for the develop phase of our players, we have to now challenge them with uh, with the bigger countries and in that way till we play them in tournaments because then. You know how how it is. You lose maybe one game and you're out of the tournament. So in in that's something I see. Um, and I like to see more with with the players. In but I individual when I look at the group, I think we have an amazing group. In um, in in look at you know the players where they play now um speaks for themselves. You know in um, in they're all young still. And what I said before, the when I look at the U19s, um, when we were with the U19s with Marco, the head coach, um, we went to England and. We beat England even 4-0 and everybody was shocked where we got the talent from, you know, because every the players we played, all the guys on the opposite, they played for Man City, Liverpool and Chelsea. And then, you know, our kids were still in, in, in uh, MLS next and in, in all this stuff. So in, 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 in nobody know even some of the players would joke with our players like, where are you playing? Oh, Dallas, where's Dallas? Oh, I come there when I retire. And I was like, man, you're not even <laughs> made the first team for, for, for City, you know, even if you make the first team. But... But that's the reality, you know. So, and I think if you look at the outside world now, um, I I say this always: the the respect goes to the guys before this generation, because the Tim Howard, the Clint, the guys who really went overseas to uh, play in England or in Europe, where the sport was not here that big. So, in um, now we all know too, it's 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 there's marketing behind it. There's so much more behind just the player. In, in a lot of teams want to go on the mar American market, right? So it plays in for a lot of players, but don't take away that they're all, you know, Christian Pulisic, Reina, uh, Weston. This is a group of talent, of big talent. Just to stick with you for one second, you know, because we see this a lot in, you know, at uh, club level too. You know, everyone's questioning Eddie Howe now because who's the next big name they're going to bring in to manage Newcastle, whereas really Eddie Howe's reinvented my own club, you know, I mean, I criticized Mikel Arteta when we were, you know, 0008. He lost to his the man that he replaced in the semifinal of Europa League. We, we fans, what do we know? There's this outrage a lot about Berhalter and the way he plays, yet he's won, I think, three cups now with this team. Um, is he... Is, is, 
we talk about next level. Can he take this team to the next level or will the proof be in the Copa America pudding this summer, Jermaine? You know, I, I always been, you know, always been behind um, Craig. I think he's a good guy. Um, is he the right guy for the group? I think in the beginning I said yes, because he has a young group and I think he connects with the young guys good. Um, down the road, as a coach, you get you get tested. Now he won it. Yes, this, this tournament's, um, you know, but the big ones are important, you know, the Copa America and, and then see how he does at the World Cup. And, and every coach get tested on that and your results speak for yourself. So, and, um, and, and that's where I think the Federation has to look in then. You know, for me, I'm not a person to say, oh, he's, he's not the right one or he's the right one. I think he he has something and he can connect with the player, especially if you talk with the, uh, with the, with the group of guys. And I think that's the most important. It's not important what the the people around think about the coach. It's important like how the crew thinks about him, and the crew connected with him. They supported him on the time when it was a little bit dark around him, and um, and, and that's something I think it's the most important. And mm. results at the end, you know, results speak for yourself. Yeah, yeah. No, well said. Um, okay, gonna get you guys out in the last few minutes here on some uh, Bundesliga. Vinny's excited about that and Premier League um, stuff. There's a massive game this weekend. Mike, I'm gonna start with you. Take your Tottenham rose colored glasses off for me. Uh, Manchester City versus Arsenal. People think it's a championship decider. Once again, all the noise and the chaos. Uh, there's still enough games to go. But it is a really massive game for Arsenal in particular to change the, na the narrative away to City. How do you see this one going? Who do you see winning the Premier League? What is your take um, on on the game and, and what's coming? Well, I think um, obviously Man City are the team to beat, right? Uh, they've been superb over the last few years uh, under Pep. Uh, he's doing amazing stuff there. Um, got some great players. Arteta's doing well as well, um, much to my dismay. Um, <laughs> he seems to, you know, have a real belief within his squad. His squad kind of played for him. I think the addition of Declan Rice he, was huge. I was uh, extremely disappointed when he went over to Highbury. But I think he's his absolute um, diamond for you guys. You know, just kind of sitting in the back there and, and holding things together and you're really creating a foundation for your place to push on and, and press on. I think it's going to be a fascinating game. Um, I'm going to be watching it with some interest, probably not the same interest as you guys <laughs> are watching it with, but uh, I, I think it'll be a really interesting game. It's three points at the end of the day. And like mm. you say, you know, there's still a ways to go. Um, but I think... If, if Arsenal win it, it's really going to turn the key for you guys uh, and, and have a sense of belief, which I think is there already. Um, but it will just facade that. And, and I think it's... Uh, I, I kind of think it's a, it's a bigger game for Arsenal um, because a yeah. win tremendous. Um, a loss, again, is, is just three points. But I, I think uh, a win for you guys is it's hugely important. I agree. Um, listen to you lot in the chat, uh, take a draw. What kind of attitude is that, Paul and Jermaine, taking a draw before the game? What's going on, Paul? Uh, I, I feel I'm not going to get cocky in any way, but for the first time in years, I'm not, you know, r rhymes with napping myself before this big game. I feel like I can actually watch it and not watch it behind the couch. Am I fooling myself? Well, no, I don't think you are. I think you've seen enough to know this Arsenal team. Um, you know my take on it. Arsenal have been my bet from the start. They have. I'm claiming it now. Um, <laughs> and I think I think when you look at it, you know, through you know, manager and a coach, there's a certain determination about this Arsenal team now. I think there's a grit and a determination there that's been questioned in the past that you do need uh, to win a title. Um, and I think they're ready for this game. I almost think they'll be looking forward to this game. And that comes from belief. The guys would know that comes from within. I think Arteta will be looking forward to it. Um, and I think they're in a great position now to, to, to beat City. I don't think they should be settling for a draw. Um, 
I'm not taking anything away. Obviously, what Pep's done has been amazing, but you do have your time at the top. And I think if Arsenal are uh, ever going to do this, it's right now. And I think as professionals, you can feel it, you can sense it. Um, I think you look at, I think John Stone's got injured, didn't he? I'm not sure if he's going to make it. They're all going to be fine, Paul. You know, Kyle Walker will be fine. Stones will be fine. They'll all be fine. Just like Harry Kane, he'll be fine. You know, when we face him in the, in in Bayern Munich, uh, we'll get Jermaine's take on that. Uh, But yeah, they'll all be fine. That's what happens. Well, 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 yeah. Okay. Even if they are fine, I think those players, they have done it. You know, they've been there and done it, but I just think there's a hunger about Arsenal and I think it's, and the stability they've got in their defence, they're very, very strong and hard to beat now. And um, I think it's going to be an amazing game, but it's one I think Arsenal will win. Jermaine, Arsenal play City, massive game. Then they've got Bayern Munich, a team you've faced for, for many, many times. Are you shocked by what's happening in Bundesliga this year? Leverkusen, are they about to go invincible, unbeaten? Um, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, everybody's surprised, but I think it's like you have to put the you know the head up and down for, for Alonso with the work he's doing. No, I I, I I talk with people in Germany and they say it's the style of play, how he plays is it's it's incredible. And he, he sets up the team good against the teams he plays. And in what I said is like um, you know, the biggest teams, what they really do good is they don't need a lot of chances. They, they they use one mistake you do and they punish you. And that's something like Man City is doing pretty good too, right? So in 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 Leverkusen is doing that pretty good right now in the season. That's why they are on the top, you know, and that's why they are uncomfortable to play. Because they can they can even let you have the ball in in in, in the, the, the the transition really good from defensive to attack. Or or they they, they, they switch it up and they press you in in the jump on you in, in in the first phase, in the attacking phase. So that's just like, you know, it's it's beautiful to see now. It's like younger coaches coming in, you know, even with mm-hmm. Ateta coming into Arsenal and in, in, in creating, you know, uh, a style of play and in getting teams turned where where people maybe had already out of the out of the loop, you know. So in and that's it's good to see because there's some some fresh wind coming in. And um, but now it's, it's it will be good, you know. If you always have the same people winning over and over. At one time, it gets boring. So it would be good to see Arsenal up there at the end of the season and in Leverkusen in, in Germany. Yes, I like that. Look at you shaking your head, Mike. Yeah, you can get him back on the bike ride maybe later on <laughs> later on today. Um, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll get you guys out on this one then. Who wins the Champions League? Jermaine, do, do Arsenal even get past um, Bayern Munich? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I think uh, Arsenal goes through. Bayern will not win it. And um, but yeah, I think Real Madrid is somebody who you know is always good mm. to to win it. They won it already so many times. They know the pressure. They know the situations. You know now with with one of the English guys to have him in. <laughs> you know that will be somebody. You know I think Real Madrid is always a, a candidate up there. Paul, what does your uh, crystal football? This is you close to um, the, the the FA Cup. Um, what does your manager slash fan brain say about the Champions League in particular? Who wins it? I think I'm I'm going to go for, I'm going to go for Arsenal. I, I really am. I, you have I, us doing the double. I, I do. I do. Some I do. I know. Because um, tell me a better team. Tell me a better team than Arsenal right now. In, in the last six weeks, seven weeks, you know, scored loads of goals. The defence has been amazing, rock solid, the two centre-backs with Rice in front. They're, a, they're, you know, they're more than capable. They've got all the, I think they've got all the, the profiles in the players to win Champions League, for sure. And I think, again, if they can, if they can do this this weekend, that'll only add to the confidence of the team. Um but I really do. I love the way Arteta's uh, sets the team up. Uh, they're aggressive home and away. They're not changing. They haven't changed. Even when they went through a bad phase, so they stuck to their guns. Um, mm. Excuse the pun. Excuse the pun. But yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Sorry, Mike. I'm a closet gooner underneath, but I'm not speaking from the from the the heart. I've got a little bit of football now, so I think they're there. I think they're ready to do it. Yep, Mike. 
well, I'm I'm going to take my coaching hat off and and talk purely as a Tottenham fan. In order for Arsenal to win, they'll have to score four goals because Kane's going to score a hat. Exactly. Yeah. That's gonna... <laughs> sorry, sorry, guys. I had to say that. It's true. As soon as that draw came up, I'm like, mm, we need to score at least three or four goals then if we're going to win this game because there's death taxes, Harry Kane scoring goals against Arsenal, guaranteed. Um <laughs> This has been really a lot of fun, brilliant stuff, and the listeners have enjoyed as well. I have to put this up for Jermaine. Good evening also for you've gotten greatness on tonight. Jermaine was my hero in my FIFA 13 career mode. Him, Hunter Laugh, our fan, Afalai, Haldes was an awesome... What a team that was, by the way. Wow. Um, Chris wants to say, Jermaine, thank you for your contribution to US soccer. Wonderful memories. Suraj, Jermaine's a legend. Uh, and also another one. Uh, well, that's a question we'll get from. We'll get Jermaine to to ask answer next time. Um, Chris says, really like it when Paul's on. He's a realist and very measured in his comments. No fluff. And Tammy, fantastic insight. Thank you, gentlemen. The same from me as well. Uh, please make sure you go follow these fellas. Um, this is Paul's handle. I've been putting them up during the show. Uh, and um, follow Mike as well, who I'm sure will will get back. Maybe he'll come back if I've I don't know if I've been that nice to him, but he'll come back for the North London derby. And check out, you know, Fuego FC if you're into a little USL and stuff. Um, this is uh, follow. Give them a follow here on the Twitter and on Instagram, and you can check out their schedule. Here um, is the website too. Hi. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for um, joining me. Appreciate it, squaddies. I will be back after the Manchester City Arsenal game uh, and uh, we will see you soon. Don't forget, Super Kev is back on Monday Madness. So, at ease, squaddies, at ease. Lots of love to you. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad.